So, Jaramil, can we start with a question one from Eskultur? So you ask, we are thinking of using attribute-based credentials for endorsing some attributes to some users to the, our web app. Would you yes. mind explaining how it works regarding the workflow using, for example, Decode app? So for the workflow of uh, Decode app, uh, I leave it to my colleagues. Uh, I can explain you the workflow in general. Okay. But Sergio, can you be more, more specific? So what is the exact question you're asking? Yeah, you, you... okay. Uh, let me explain. Our, our application is about uh, uh, learning. It's a learning application. It's for, for teachers. And the idea is that the, the teachers have uh, courses. Each course have some classrooms uh, and each classroom have has some some learners okay the the teacher uh, puts uh, puts grades to the learners and after that we have some kind of reports okay and we have also interoperability with several applications uh, our idea is to to have some kind of credentials that for the for the learner that demonstrate that the learner has uh, past the some course or some degree, but without showing the the grades and the data, and this is more or less uh, the thing I understood for attribute based credential credentials is something like that. But I don't I don't know if I have to make the signature in the backend and how how it works. Uh, no, okay, no, but so, was... Sergio, this this kind of stuff I can answer as well, and uh, uh, this is very it's very specific. So let yeah. let's take a different session. Let's see how many people need to use attribute attribute based credentials, and maybe we do a small webinar just for that, because that, that's something that uh, me and probably also Mia can help with right now. Okay. So, now now we're talking. So this round we're gonna we're gonna talk about more. Uh, generic talks about uh, cryptography and blockchain about uh, best practices that are more general. That's the idea. But this one, right. we'll figure it out. Don't worry. For, okay. for a quick answer, I took the notes on the pad. I just switched the term uh, learners with uh, pupils. It's, it's also useful. Okay. okay. Um, the, I think that the generic use case is that the teacher becomes an issuer together with the school probably. So you have two issuers in the scheme. And these issuers are able to sign credentials and the credentials are degrees. And this way you can map it to the existing uh, coconut uh, uh, credential scheme. At that point, you have attributes and uh, and they can uh, they cannot be traced so you can show yes you pass the degree it's signed by the teacher and the school and um, it's not revocable so there is you have uh, it, indeed uh, as andrea says it's it's sort of easy because you don't revoke a degree after obtaining it and uh, so then you can show it Okay, thank you, Danny. I'll write it also on the panel. Yeah? All right. Yeah, we we can go on. I think that from now we can start from the top. Uh, so basically in the pads we have on top, we have questions about cryptography and below we have questions about blockchain. So I think maybe we can start, uh, we can start on top here. And uh, the first question is from GPP. Uh, that's very interesting. That I'm also interested to hear.
Can I read it? Yes, please. Yeah. Okay, I'm done writing with that uh, without being trapped. Uh, so, private and public key topic, where is better to save them? Yeah, there is not a blanket uh, uh, answer to this. Let's see the, the look at the interaction. Only on the user device or server side. Storing it on user device side can be a problem, considering that migrants can easily lose their device during the trip. So we need a straightforward way to make user account recovery procedure, even from different devices, and to the, recover the relative documentation files. Do you have anything to suggest us? Yes, plenty of scenarios, but uh, you must choose in, based on your threat model. Uh, okay, now let's take this generic uh, can be lost threat model then uh, uh, of course, there can be more uh, uh, threat models, like uh, uh, more elements, like uh, the server is act, and um, passwords are forgotten. Your own organization disappears, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, but sticking to the most simple one, I think there are two generically bigger, uh, more uh, common approaches. One is to uh, do a, a secret sharing of sorts of the password. Andrea may have told you this already. Um, yes. We, yeah, we have that, you implemented that room in your, in your code. So you have that out of the box with, uh, um, based on uh, uh, numbers, on a sequence of numbers. So, you do secret sharing of a password, let's say. And that password is a sequence of numbers, which is an advantage because it is um, easy to memorize uh, as, a, as a phone number on an agenda or to communicate. Numbers are less ambiguous. Yes. And uh, then uh, you can reconstruct this password uh, helped by two uh, out of three or five out of eight databases. Let's keep it simple, two out of three. It means that the migrant has the password. If the migrant uh, loses it, there are three people in the organization that have access to a piece of the password and need to agree in order to, at least two need to agree in order to give back the migrant the password. Okay. Why is complexity? It's because it, it's uh, a, a, if the threat model is that there is an um, uh, internal attack uh, or a social engineering attack yes. inside the organization to obtain the password. Then, what do you do with these passwords? You do a AES GCM on encryption. You encrypt the, the content on the server. So the server is completely agnostic, backup, of course. It doesn't, it, it does hold the data, but cannot be read without the password. The migrant has the full password and you have pieces to recover. Another uh, uh, option I can think of is to take away the complexity of the secret sharing and then to, um, save the password somewhere, protected by one password of the organization. Uh, you trust your organization uh, a lot that way, but then you can access the password once the migrant asks to recover it. This is what uh, most uh, old school uh, services do. Uh, comes to mind the third scenario, let's make a scenario, a simple scenario, what uh, major organizations do today uh, it's uh, way less secure than what I'm saying. Uh, for instance, uh, Facebook, uh, Twitter, uh, all these uh, big uh, players, they rely on your email or SMS. Let alone uh, um, national identity organizations. They rely on your uh, uh, network providers as email and SM SMS especially. So the SMS, uh, the GSM infrastructure is already uh, covered by uh, regulations like Etsy. 
and they keep identities of people uh, that have the thing. So it all trickles down to that uh, identity system. And they say, okay, you lose the password, I send you an SMS back with a token to do a new password. Why they don't give you the, the old password? Not only because by communicating it, they would uh, send, send it on a weak channel, but because most likely they don't have it. They have it encrypted on their, on their uh, database. This is how usual like, like mainstream systems work. And it's uh, not exactly end-to-end -end encryption because it's a mnemonic password. It's hashed and matched to a hash on the hard disk on the server. If it matches, you know the password. If it doesn't matches, uh, you don't know the password and you must reset it. And then you get a reset email or a reset SMS. In brief, this is how they work. Okay. But it's not the end to end encryption. This is like uh, server. Yes, and so when we see the hacking, uh, people hack the database in which most likely your name and username is written an email and, and phone number. Then they get the hash and then they use uh, uh, CUDA accelerated uh, uh, farms to crack the hashes, which is also possible and obtain the password. So this, this is the, the existing system and the main threat model that recurs. So to avoid this, uh, uh, it's tricky, but of course, if you change the architecture of things, it's, uh, it, it, you have probabilities. Let's say the server holds the encrypted data, not the hash of the password. So it's AES, GCM, it's a little bit uh, more rounds of hashing and blah. And, uh, and then, and then you put the password as a mnemonic. So I thought of your case. Uh, um, of course, I read about it. Uh, it's a very, very interesting project. Um, and, and yeah, you have a high ethical profile, but also responsibility. Yes, then yes. you need uh, yeah, to think hard how you want to hold. Uh, so mnemonics, I would go to mnemonics, uh, uh, to the side of mnemonics, and eventually you uh, providing a password without storing in a database associated with data and um, proceed to a, a sort of uh, a personal re-identification of sorts. Uh, another approach that comes to mind, we, we can have a longer session about this because I need to hear no more from you basically, but um, Another approach that comes to mind is to have multiple ways to authenticate. Why, why a, a migrant should have only one password, one uh, card, one thing? Should they have more than one? Uh, one is lost, uh, the other one works still. Like pin and pook. Yeah, pin and pook uh, is, is, is an example. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Jeremy. I'll share it uh, with my colleagues. Thank you very much. Okay, so this was a GPP, as Kotul we answered. Then we have Liv. Hello. Um, so as uh, we are explaining on, on the path, what we wanted to do is give an overview of the approach we took to uh, ensure privacy and the encryption approach that we're taking. So uh, Alexei is gonna give now a brief basically of, I, I don't know if you prefer to read from the pad or that he gives a brief. I already read it. Okay. It's fine. But I don't understand the question. It sounds you are doing well. So you're using RSA to sign, which is old school, um, uh, competency with uh, that has been kept around. Your signatures will be bigger. I recommend using 4K okay. and uh, back in the days, Bruce Schneier already predicted that anything of 1K and 2K RSA could be cracked uh, mm -hmm. in 2015. Okay. I think it's sort of true. So it's better that you use 4K. I personally have an RSA key and I, I, 
tweaked it to be 8K. Uh, yeah. But say that RSA is completely compliant, and then you have uh, AES256 GCM. Uh, I think you're using it in uh, IAD, AEAD mode, so with an authenticated header. Mm -hmm. A E A D. Uh, what what you're doing is classifies as the same as we have in. Uh, So at least I can provide you the documentation for this. There is authenticated encryption on Wikipedia. I'm sure your, your developer knows it. Thanks. And you're using Galois counter mode. And what is, what is your question? So it was more to, um, because this came up on a previous meeting uh, about making sure that how, what the information we were putting on the blockchain and how we were encrypting the rest because it's uh, highly confidential and sensitive data. So we w just wanted to show the approach we're taking uh, to just make sure that, uh, I mean, the, the program it's uh, aware and has assurance and any comments like you're doing right now. What you're putting on in public what are you publishing of this? Um, so, uh, Alexei, correct me if I'm wrong. I think we are uh, a, a having the a, a, the the, not the uh, public number. Uh, Alexei, can you can you just correct? yeah? Uh, is this the question of uh, what information about the user we are publishing? Like their identifier or the public key, or you mean the parts of the implementation that we are uh, publishing in our open No, no, open uh, about the data of the user. If I can help oh. you realize what to publish or not. Well, uh, we uh, store the um, identifier of the user on the blockchain. Um, and this identifier is generated by passion D uh, the part of the personal information of the user. So, uh, so when when we store this identifier on the blockchain, uh, there won't be a way to tie directly to the user identity. And right, also, by GDPR regulations, you are bound to private data, a hash of a unique hash of uh, private, uh, actually a unique identifier falls huh? into GDPR regulation. So you will have, have to ask users to, uh, to sign um, GDPR uh, agreements. Oh, okay. We, we haven't thought about it that way because, well, if, uh, if we, for example, add salt when generating this identifier, then it, there will not be a way to uh, reconstruct it, so it's uh, not really a personal data, or am I wrong? Uh, it, if it's if it's a unique identifier of the user on your system, that's uh -huh. what the regulation says. Oh, that's I why see. we use uh, zero knowledge proof. Mm -hmm. Because a hash, uh, a unique identifier hash, it's uh, it's a unique identifier. Mm -hmm. So also if yeah, you put some yeah, randomness in, inside, which is advisable, but then you set it as the identifier of that user and it's in your system. Mm -hmm. uh, I can give you the, the some papers, uh, some research papers on this. Uh, there is okay. okay it's, thank you. It's, I know it's a pain. <laughs> that, uh, <laughs> it's it's painful. <laughs> yeah, sure. And I have a question about your use of uh, AES. Uh, what do you use as a IV? Uh, sorry, uh, my connection interrupted. Could you please repeat? Yeah, yeah. A question about the AES uh -huh. is what do you use as a IV? Uh, well, we haven't started to implement uh, to implement uh, the AES encryption yet because initially we. Uh, had different scheme of encryption. Uh, so now we're redoing it a little bit to 
uh, make it compliant with our new approach. So we haven't decided on that part yet. Okay, then I advise you just use a strong random for the ID. Mm -hmm. Because some people use um, an hash of the a previous block in uh, counter mode, you can do streaming mm -hmm. uh, IDs, but don't bother, use a, a strong um, random uh, ID. Mm -hmm. Okay, we will take that into consideration when we start implementing. That's mostly all I can share uh, about this uh, topic, but it sounds good. Okay, thank you. Thanks. I for should be a strong random. Uh, Jarmil, what do you define a strong random? Uh, sorry, a cryptographic random, crypto random, uh, yeah. PRNG. So yeah, you but... take a random number and you pass it through some hashing, at least. Oh, okay, but how big should be the number? 64 bytes. The result should be always 64 bytes. Therefore, you use a SHA-256 for hashing. Did you say, sh sh say, say the last thing? SHA-256. SHA ah, SHA-256, yes. Not at least, but exactly of 64 bytes. Otherwise, the, the, it breaks. OK, ah, all right. This is all uh, in that room. If you use Xenon for this, it's all checked. Yeah, that's true. OK, guys, the, from Liv, do you have, uh, is it OK? Do you have the questions or can, can we move on? Yes, sure. That was very helpful, thank you. Can, can, we, uh, can we move on to next yeah. question? OK, cool. So next one is Orvium. Yeah, it's more or less a similar question than Antonio. So Ant Antonio Di Battista and Antonio Romero asked the same question. Or not? Maybe, yeah, I think that the, the probably is a question quite uh, general, no? Mm, yeah. So in a, just to, to add something maybe that is not completely clear from, from that. So our worry is that, um, so the way we do it right now is that we use uh, AES um, encryption, but um, the way it is, okay, if you get access to the secret key somehow, um, you get access to basically all the, the, the passwords and users um, and client IDs from the users. So um, my question here, is there any way to mitigate and, and minimize the problem and how to manage this uh, private data that we need to actually encrypt and decrypt in our backends because we need the, this integration with the third party services. What do you mean by integration with third party services? Yeah, you basically need to communicate for... the data to the third party. Yes, uh, so this is um, so it is a cloud based application where you as a an user can say, okay, I want um, to integrate with. Uh, I don't know, within Google Drive, imagine, no? It's a third party service. So I put my client ID and my private key. And then our backend will read data from Google Drive, no? And you, you know, it's um, like a normal in case of, uh, in case of cloud uh, applications, they, sh they should offer um, tokens. Yeah, uh, as in, in some in some cases they use tokens. For example, in in the case of Google, you can we use uh, OAuth tokens and so on. And there we can we can do. But there are some REST APIs services that basically we we have what we have is a client ID and a password, um, and that's everything we have. <laughs> and so you need to you know. know the ID and password for that service. It needs to be communicated to you and that represents a liability. Yes, yeah. So in, specifically in this case, what we are talking is, for example, data site uh, and then the user has a subscription to data site, to this third party service, and they put their client ID and their, and their password. 
basically they can create multiple clients IDs and they can, let's say, uh, specify, you know, what kind of uh, rights this specific key has, no? But still, we need to store it somehow. So, and, and yes, um, I don't know, for example, my question is also maybe it's not, maybe specifically cryptographic in sense of how to improve the encryption. I know that there are some services or platforms like um, the HashiCorp uh, Vault, which is a to, to manage secrets and, and these kind of things. I don't know. It's a bit open question to see what can we do to, midi, to minimize exposure, yeah. Okay, in a, yeah, okay. In an ideal world, you use OAuth. Um, yeah. If the, the service doesn't provide the OAuth, you should pressure them to, to implement a one-time token. One reason is that you are uh, you will acquire a liability about the identification of their service. The second reason is that the user will not be able to um, revoke. Participants to your program will not be able to revoke the access of your application. They have to change everything. The password. But okay, bearable. Uh, I think the liability is the biggest. What you can do to securely store this data is a basic thing is to store it on a server and store the key elsewhere. <coughs> Sorry. It means that the key is not on the server. And every time you want to access the data, the key needs to be provided to the server. And this becomes uh, quickly a Matrioska game because if the, there is quick access, then uh, as in this case, then you need to have the key uh, automatically available. And then uh, what you do is uh, you put a SSH connection to the key, let's say. Uh, I advise that is better than nothing because you can revoke the SSH key you can revoke the access. And Vault is uh, nothing, uh, nothing really special. You can implement the HashiCorp uh, uh, Vault uh, by yourself. Imagine you have um, a server with SSH uh, um, access only through public and private keys. Okay. And you have uh, um, uh, files uh, that are the keys to access the data elsewhere. Uh, then uh, elsewhere, you have a, a, a storage where the actual data of the user is. And this storage has a SSH key registered to the key server. So you have a key server and a database storage for the authentication that helps connecting to the third party. Okay. So the key storage is accessed via SSH public key, public private key. In the moment in which the data storage is hacked, you can, at least you have an opportunity to remove this SSH key from the key storage and deny further access. Then, okay. then the, the keys are not anymore on the data storage and the hackers will not be able to uh, brute force them so easily because you have separated the keys it's not a password protection, but it's a higher uh, uh, encryption. Hey, Jeremy, can you please uh, write a line or two about this the, uh, in the in the pad? Because this is a, this is a very interesting point. Uh, uh, so you, when, whenever you can, use SSH. Don't use a password. Yeah, it applies to other uh, uh, to other teams as well. Yeah. And it's and uh, easy to implement, eh? rather easy. Yeah. You can actually, use a combination of their room uh, command line and SSH and, uh, and a bash script. Yes. I, I will try to write something about this because I've seen it done. I've seen, a, I've seen uh, someone setting up uh, an SSA uh, protection for uh, terminal access and it's actually pretty simple. It's easy, much easier than, than, you, get, than you think.
without credentials. Key, allora, out credential storage and key storage separation. There is also an ISO documents that talk about it. The out credential ID pass encrypted with the IS, so yeah, let's say you use then and then it's ETAS. Two key storage server holds the keys to decrypt the out credentials. Out storage has a SSH key pair registered as key pair. SSH public key is registered as authenticated. Uh, how is it called? Uh, authenticated uh, authorized keys. Okay, I wrote a little bit about this. A proof of concept can also be worked out. And this is, uh, in general, a, a strategy to store the data in a vault-like system. So what, what would you do in this case uh, also I put in between parentheses, maybe also protected by user input password. Or uh, you can do there also secret sharing, but user input password. So a user logs in to your service. Your service uh, connects uh, to the key server, takes the key, decrypts it with the password. So you have a three factor encryption. The the user uh, uh, password, the, the key on the key server, and finally the data that is encrypted on the storage server. Okay, yeah, and well, in our, this specific case, uh, and actually I, I'm now thinking, and that's maybe why OAuth maybe didn't, it wouldn't work as well, because um, what we need is that the user uh, introduce this information, but this information is used when the user is not logged in in the application. So basically it's like like an API key where we will do things in the background, but the user session will expire, but we will still communicate with this other party, third party service in the background. So it's not, um, so the way is that um, 
the user will just send us the, the credentials, let's say, of this connection API, like in the same way that you do with um, Google Maps, no? that you have an API key and so on, and then we will interact with the third party service. Because actually in this, um, this case, um, the data site provides us some, some metadata no, for, this, uh, for the research papers, but the research papers are not created directly by the user. No? The user receives the papers in the platform and then we register them in the data site API. And that might come two weeks later or three weeks and the user is not logged in and so on. Okay, then you don't use a, a user password, but you have an authentication that is fully automatic between your system and the other system. Yes. But I think that um, the protection that you said on the um, using something like, yeah, a, a, no, an additional layer with an SSH um, like thing, no, uh, can help um, in many ways because, as you say, for example, also SSH is pretty easy to maintain and it's pretty easy to block access to everything. And then you have all the logs, who, I mean, who logged in, what has been done during this, those sessions. So I think I like that way because it's uh, not difficult. It doesn't add so many, so much complexity. No, we, we hate complexity. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's no, a, it is a, something that every sysadmin knows how to manage. Yeah. We yeah, hope no, that every sysadmin knows how to manage. Should. We hope. Yeah. <laughs> no one should, no sysadmin should ever use a, only a password. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Can I ask a, a question about this vault concept, uh, just to understand the, the protection? Because uh, I was thinking that if I hack the authorization storage server and I get the private key, then I do all the SSH I want and I get all the keys from the key storage. Uh, in very fast, you will not stop me, right? Even if it's two separate servers. Or is it something more than that? There's something more than that happening. If you put a password, there is something more. Otherwise, it's about the, the speed of the of revocation. Yeah, OK, understand. So what you can do is at least revoke the access. But yes, one could uh, copy everything. You can compartiment, uh, compartmentalize on the other side um you can i mean it enters the domain of unix uh, permission something that uh, sysadmin can handle but uh, it indeed if if i enter there is only one access to ssh that holds all the keys i copy them all and then if there is no password protection then uh, yeah but uh, i don't see any other uh, uh, solution if i mean encryption here helps with OAuth. so one one uh, one one time token that should should really be the thing uh, used at the end i think that uh, uh, the choice of a service should be also uh, driven by the presence of OAuth. So it's preferable to have all that million. Write this down just to <laughs> thanks because it's not advisable, but Any other? Uh, Jeremy, this is Teresa from Leaf. Uh, just uh, following up on uh, what Stefano was asking and what you said about 
um, compartmenting the information. There's something similar we're thinking about um, at, uh, where we are trying to reduce the risk of a hack. And, and, and given that we're gonna be storing very sensitive information, um, we, we were thinking about splitting this information among different databases and that adding some kind of encryption or method. So, so for instance, on one side, we have the, and on a database, what it relates to the person and their ID. Another, another part, we have the information related to the will and because that information will be released to certain people at certain point in time, we also think that it will be very dangerous if that information is released before time. Uh, so we want to separate these three things and, and keep it encrypted and with a method that uh, reduces as much as possible that if we suffer a, a hack, that they just can be able to have one of these three areas and they cannot connect or relate to the other stuff. So we minimize uh, this. And I don't know if based on what you said, if you had any views on what it would be a good approach. In your case, if the access is not automate, automatic, so in all of these, if you can insert a um, human operation, mm -hmm. uh, which is anyway there in many identification processes as of today anyway, uh, if you can insert human uh, a human operation, then you don't incur in the risk of automatized access. It means, uh, because in your case, uh, a will, uh, you will have a human operator. You can give a token like a USB stick to this human operator with a key on, and the key is inserted, and then the operation starts. Mm -hmm. This way you can store the key on a cold storage and, uh, and you can also separate the keys but then it makes sense more to separate the storage because you don't incur in this auto, uh, automatic thing the problem in this um, of course that that is that has to be mentioned is uh, especially without password protection of keys mm. because then you have revoc revocable access but you have to be in time and if you have a password protection of keys, you have a third key, you have an additional element that is offline, then uh, it's human operated, and then uh, you can uh, uh, implement this sort of thing on a, on a, this on a larger picture. Hmm. But if you automate everything, it then if you automate everything and you use this sort of encryption, which is only public private key encryption and, and authentication. Then you can you have to imagine that a hacker can get into a point of the flow mm -hmm. and as the flow goes automatic, escalates to any other point. All right. And because uh, you also mentioned previously, obviously if, if we stored the uh, key on, on a USB uh, type of device, then, then we have the additional issue of what happens if they lose the, the USB. So I don't know if there's somewhere in between a, a different approach, like some something hybrid. Yeah, you can, you can copy it. You can keep copies safely and there you can split it. Right. But already having a physical access or it can be a mnemonic password that mm. one or more people know. But yeah, a physical USB key uh, it's it's a sort of um, seal. Hmm. Okay, okay, thanks. You should not lose the seal, but this reflects also the um, the sort of uh, structure of trust in an organization. The person that should have the most trust to keep keys is the person that is best best at keeping keys. Hmm. There is no uh, no way out from yeah. uh, this skill. I mean, you need a skilled person. Uh, at, at this point of complexity, then I would say it's up to the person that is presumably a skilled person at keeping keys to choose uh, uh, her or his own uh, strategy. Right.
Thank you. It's a, it's a problem that you're facing with this because you don't adopt uh, um, new next generation encryption like zero knowledge proof. Zero knowledge proof. Yeah, I yeah I will be looking at this. Because then, if you have the possibility to um, have an operation that is is made separate, then instead of a password and ID, you use their knowledge proof authentication, which cannot be replicated. You can have um, every authentication is different and you can avoid the replay. Hmm. And then every opening is different. Every, every message to open is different and the key is held on one person. So what is advisable is if you have, um, let's say this we implement in Zero. If you have a, a, a issuer signing a credential and you can use this credential to access a service. So on your server, you verify the credential to give, grant access to the service. And uh, as soon as you verify it, you discard it. You don't save anything on the server. Mm -hmm. The one that produces the credential, every time the credential is produced, is different. And if you want to avoid the replay, you save the Z. Uh, this is, is in the scenario credential. Um, I think in the petition scenario, but I don't know if it's documented, Andrea, the use of UID and Z. Perhaps? Not, not documented. We, we could write something about it, but- We uh, could write not. something. Because yeah. if, you, if you manage to keep uh, these in a, in, a, in a separate place, then every time you produce the authentication, the authentication produces a non-traceable token, but also a unique number for that unique transaction. And on the server side, all you have to do is save the unique number so that it's not repeated. Mm -hmm. And every time produce a new UID. Right. This means that there is no replay attack, so I cannot listen to the credential and replay it because it's, it's used already. Hmm. And then uh, this leads to an authentication that uh, you don't, uh, there is, it's what is produced on your side authenticates you to enter somewhere else, and then you, you discard that, that information. You have to protect the secret keys. They are the most precious thing, of course, but then you keep them on a USB. Right. It, in the, the, is this um, scalable or or will it, I mean, it doesn't, it sounds like it has a component of, of manual or as you said before, like a personal uh, step in. So I just wonder if, if we were to increase the number, increase the number of uh, requests uh, to a high level, um, is this sustainable? It's uh, very, very scalable because if you look at the major uh, blockchain systems that are in use now, they are uh, either a, a primitive version of this or this like uh, uh, Bitcoin or Zcash, uh, you have the keys. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's how it works. Uh, a wallet, the most secure wallet for Bitcoin is Electrum because it doesn't hold your keys but yet it can operate transaction right. uh, because the keys are not stored on the server. And um, that, that's how they work. I think it's very, very scalable, but of course it puts, uh, it's end-to-end -end encryption. So it, it gives uh, the user some responsibility. Then if you think the user is unable, which is unfortunately uh, very times true, to keep a, a long time, a long term secret, then you apply on that end um, 
a recovery system. Mm. Yep. Okay. So the, the credential system, the credential scenario in the room uh, with examples on API room is what I'm talking about. It's just that we uh, we need to add then a Z, which is and a UE for the transaction. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think I had a lot of um, food for thought. I would like to make sure that it's connected to what I said before. So in this scenario of uh, revocable access, it's, it's sort of difficult to apply what I just say, unless you have, again, um, an intervention of a, of a user. And what would happen is that the key server accepts a credential to access, so it has an authentication uh, with, with the zero knowledge proof credential. So the user types the password, generates the credential, or takes the secret key, generates the credential, access the key server, obtains that information to access its own data. Um, let's say the storage server and the key server, they both accept credential authentication, zero knowledge proof credential authentication. And the client decrypts it locally. So retrieves it and decrypts it locally. Because end-to-end -end encryption means edge computation as well. So you can compute things on your end if you have a mobile app. Now, also imagine with a weaker uh, uh, system, so being traceable this way, you can substitute this with the SSH key as well. So the user has the SSH key instead of the storage server on the client. The client accesses the, um, the out storage and the key storage, decrypts the secret, and uses it. But uh, in case of uh, Orbium, I don't think this is a solution because I understand that your server needs to build a connection to the third party and not the client. Yeah, it's a machine to machine communication. Yeah, from the, yeah, in this case. It's like, um, if you are used to GitHub and so on, no, and you have yours, continuous integration server in another site. So they need to communicate uh, yeah, when something happens and even happens in your in, in GitHub, no? And then it goes directly to, to the continuous integration service, no? Which is a bit in another site. So, but this event might be triggered by something that is not an user logging in or doing something, no? And yeah, we don't have a, uh, we, we don't have this human intervention, uh, at least not the human that has the, the, let's say the credentials for the third party API. Yeah. Still, I, I might have an, a, a question. It's a bit general on this, um, some, um, like AI's encryptions, no? You normally have a seat, no? Your your private key and so on. Um, is there any, do you recommend to do rotation with the seats? Like, I don't know, or normally it's not necessary. I don't know how you do it there. Uh, is, does it have any value or is just complexity without too much value? Which seed? Um, well, normally in the, I, I'm sorry, because I'm not really an expert on here, but I know that we have, we use AIS, uh, AIS encryption for the email confirmation that I, I really know, where we send a token encrypted. And basically in the token, we have some data codified, no? Um, and I know that we have stored 
in our API um, and a key, an encryption key. Um, but I don't know which part of the AI's encryption it is. Yeah. Okay. In general, as a rule of thumb, it's better to have more keys, more key pairs, and to not reuse keys. Of course, I mean, you have a key pair for one thing, but if you're asking yourself, this new thing, should it have a new key pair? The answer is yes, unless there are no space constraints. Once you introduce, okay. once you implemented a key storage, you can store more keys. Okay, that that's probably my question. Yes, I think it's uh, it, it's if I understand well. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. We have two hours for this meeting. Uh, yeah, book two, but it's very the thing that we're gonna finish earlier. Let's see. Well, there is okay. time. So this was Orview. Then we have Ginkop, and uh, yeah, I think that the question is always the same. Private keys, public keys, where to keep them? Yeah, or uh, yeah, exactly. So we are starting to think about the cryptography in our project, and uh, as a server, consent server. So we we would store the consent of a user regarding DNA uh, data usage, said very in a few words. So we're thinking as a server, as an, uh, we would like to store as little as possible about the user. So do all this kind of uh, uh, advanced cryptography based maybe on public, uh, on the private key of the user. Uh, but the problem exactly is like uh, we might be forced to, um, in case the user loses access to, to his own, her own consent, and maybe we might be forced to give it back because there might be some legal value to this document, so we, we cannot just disappear. So the, the, I, I exactly is in the line of the, the question, more or less, of a, of a GPP project. <clears throat> so I was thinking, how complex is, is it in reality to, to, to build this share um, thing, share secret uh, that you were mentioning before, and to make it a little bit uh, meaningful, uh, I wonder if you have to spread the secret not only across your organization, because again, <clears throat> maybe you are the same organization and then you might give it to one person as well. Uh, if it, uh, what are the conditions that you think you need to, to have to have a decent, you know, spreading, let's say, let's put it this way, just not, not like one organization controlled by one, you know, same group of people as a necessary secret it doesn't make much sense to spread it in the sense uh, so the, the the implementation is simple you can see it on happy room there is an example so there are um, i think three examples for uh, the uh, sharing and uh, and of course, you can combine that to a PBKDF, so a password-based key derivation function to avoid brute forcing, add some strength. So you can add some uh, strength to it. But there is, a, it's, it's simple. Um, it produces, as I said before, uh, numeric sequences. Uh, there is uh, no limit. I don't know. You you made tests, Andrea. What is the limit for the um, for our implementation? What limit exactly? How many keys can be produced? Uh, I think I put a limit in there. But yeah, you can produce many shards. Ah, and... in the, with with Lagrange, you mean? Yeah. I tested it until nine thousand pieces. Per... Right. Okay. No, no, the limit is just uh, the memory location. Okay. So it's, you can uh, produce uh, many, many shards, let's say um, five out of eight scheme. Then uh, um, the reconstruction of the shard that should be, okay, protected by a PBKDF, but that's uh, one more uh, Zen code line or, uh, this, or in this, any other library. This I don't uh, understand. The password based key derivation function should mm -hmm. protect the final secret. And I'm still not there. So I have a secret, I split it in nine parts. 
and I assign five and five with four quorum of five. And then what happens? The secret you talk about mm -hmm. the, is it should be not used ah, as okay. is. Okay. All right. So the secret before sharing it, I do when I use it, I do PBKDF. When you use it, not when before okay. sharing. When you use it. When this way, it, yeah, uh, it prevents brute forcing by adding a computational cost to its use. Okay, so basically, it's one more layer of encrypt of cryptography because I use a password on top uh, with hashing on top of the secret. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I get it. Mm -hmm. Cool. So then you share the, the the forum, and since there is no limit, it's really up to your organizational structure and trust architecture. Um, I advise, since there is quorum, to make many, but it's up to you. The only thing is that the, the quorum needs to be lower than the total. So if you think that the three out of 20 uh, are enough, because you have 20 very trusted partners, it's like, look, it's like, um, let's take the case of Lib, because uh, I, I also very much like uh, always the case of a uh, testament uh, uh, of sorts. It's very easy to visualize the trust. So let's say we are uh, five heirs, and um, and we are entitled, uh, uh, three of us, to unlock uh, patrimony under custody with our signature, share, whatever. The, the worry should be that uh, uh, one of us, if we would have all uh, a single password access, one of us could be betraying the family and accessing the patrimony and bringing it away without the consent of others. If we have a quorum three out of five, the, the elder uh, in this case can uh, be sure that at least three of five descendants need to betray her or him. So it's less likely that that happens. Now, if you have 20 trustees and a quorum three, of course, is more likely that three out of 20 can actually coalesce to betray the system. This is literally trust architecture. I know it can be painful to think about it, but. No, but I was just for, so I understand this. I was wondering uh, when you want to put your organization a bit also to, to show that you cannot, uh, even if you want uh, maliciously, let's say, change things, so shouldn't you have uh, uh, the distribution of this uh, secret also somehow outside your organization somehow so that, you know, you can you can uh, you can guarantee that uh, if you collude within an organization, you you're also still not able to do. Yes. To... Yes, I'm not talking about one organization. I'm talking about twenty different organizations. It's very similar uh, to make another example on how Dutch foundations work. So there is a board of trustees that is not included in the actually working day to day team. And this board of trustees is sort of external to the organization and not cryptographically, but holds the keys to certain decisions. So you can build a structure like this. You can also say this project has a board of trustees of these organizations or people, and they hold the key and they are three and two out of three are enough to take our decision. All right. It's the same, yeah, it can be out of the organization. It is already in in uh, legal structures. <clears throat> Jeremy, are there examples already of, of uh, organizations who are doing it like this? Yes, many crypto DAOs are doing this. Great. Um, so everything you read about DAO in the last 10 years, like I think the first DAO was announced around uh, 2003. Then there are, um, no, uh, 13, sorry, or, or 15. Now we have uh, five years of history of uh, DAOs, decentralized autonomous organizations. And they work like this, but on a large quorum because uh, shareholders are uh, anyone that has bought some asset and then they vote, let's say, by uh, giving their share. 
of course, now there are also easier ways to do this uh, without losing your share. So zero knowledge proof makes it easier, but just to keep it simple, now if you have a share, it's one share, one vote on one specific vote, which is given to you. And then if a quorum is reached, uh, the secret is unlocked. <clears throat> Thank you. It, it fits well with the way we also want to set up the cooperation, I think. Uh, one of the questions I have related to the ledger and the things we store in the ledger, I th we need to give, uh, of course, the, the citizen and the researchers access to the ledger so they can see what happened as, as a ledger part. But um, I foresee that uh, we also have queries for um, us as a corporation, for instance, or others <clears throat> who want to query uh, basically uh, not just one uh, uh, consent, <clears throat> but uh, a number of consents. And then we also get uh, the question, of course, what, what happens if you... Um, uh, query uh, the ledger um, and get also a lot of uh, uh, probably uh, valuable information out of it. And can we also control it from an access point of view that we say you are allowed to, uh, to query it for one person if you have the keys for that person. Uh, but if you have the right questions, you can also uh, ask it on behalf of 10, which have to give their consent then again. So we uh, can, can make dashboards and these type of services, which go across it basically. And I think we need another key then to, to, uh, to allow for that as well, so that it's not open. You want to make a collective query, let's say. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, if the key is... Uh, uh, there is one thing with using the current secret key. We are working on a new cryptographic scheme, but uh, for now, that's what we have. Um, there is one thing to know, is that if you use the key, then the key is known. So a collective query is a single opportunity of a collective query. Right. That, that is exactly what we need. Otherwise, it also uh, it is, is unique each time we query it, basically. Unique each time. Okay. Yeah, Keeping great. this in mind, you can do that. Good. <laughs> Thank you. All right, that was Jinka. And this, I mean, says this was kind of answered the ball. Okay, so we can, uh, can we move on? Yeah, private, public. Yes, Stratos, do you want to articulate something? Is there anything well, more you want to Okay. Let me show you my face well. So basically what we are interested in is the in the user experience of the um, encryption stuff, not encryption only, but authentication as well and authorization. So we're currently using in the mobile app um, email and password, uh, JD, JWT token uh, based authentication, which is, you know, a user friendly kind of way to authenticate. But if we want to proceed with um, encrypting uh, the user data with a public private key mechanism, is JWT still um, relevant? And how do you connect both? Because having the user create their own uh, private key and then use it and perhaps losing it, uh, that's, that would be a problem. So uh, Zaramil kind of answered, no, she answered it actually uh, before. Um, I, I'm right now considering um, one of Zaramil's options um, like providing a hardware key. Since we are providing hardware as, as well, we could ship a hardware USB key. Uh, and which in this case is, uh, the, the question is how do you use it uh, on a mobile phone, for example, to authenticate with an app? So there, are, there's a certain complexity to using a USB token device. I just wanted to, you know, to share your opinion on this as well. Um, okay, first question, JWT does not relate uh, to encryption. Uh, it's usually a token for authentication. Uh, the token is produced with a public-private key pair. So your question is basically if you can reuse these key pairs for also encryption. Yes. Could that be an option, do you think? 
uh, I think it's not advisable. Any production uh, system separates uh, the keys, signing keys from encryption keys. Uh, but for you, it's not a big problem because if you implement a storage for the JWT keys, on the same storage, you can add a different key, which is the encryption key, using the same algorithm, the same library that you use. So uh, let's say you use a Edwards 25519 key. Uh, you keep, you just generate a new key pair and, uh, and you store it besides the other one. And one key is for signing and one key is for encryption. How do we store it securely? You already store the job JWT. But the JWT is like, um, I mean, it's disposable. It's, it depends how the store. I mean, uh, I don't know which one you implement, but uh, uh, it's not completely disposable. There is a key somewhere. Maybe oh, we, yeah, the key, yes, the key, yes. It's like it's it's passed in uh, to the server with a configuration. So that is the the token that you pass. No, the the secret that the server is using to generate to generate the JWT token. Yeah. Uh, it's passed to the server uh, uh, with configuration and uh, environment variable. Okay, so you give uh, you give the the secret key and then you let the server. Uh, then yeah, you don't so, have storage for a secret key. Yes, exactly. Uh, I, I would say then it's a completely pass. It's all uh, server based, so you don't have end to end encryption. Yes, so you, have, you have a point of uh, the server is the weak point for um, for a, for a storage. Then I understand uh, your question. You have you want to store it somewhere. So uh, use a credential storage like uh, you mentioned earlier. Uh, yeah, yeah. The, the hardware storage. I mean, it can it's difficult to plug on a on a um, on a. Mobile. I use it on a computer. I use this. It's like a YubiKey, but uh, yeah, this uh, thing. Yeah, I know. I, I'm using it too for digital signatures and stuff. Yeah, the ST Link. These are uh, one, two euros uh, worth uh, devices, and uh, YubiKey is a branded uh, version, uh, ten euros. But then um, you. You have a problem with uh, with mobile phones, indeed. What most? Uh, uh, let's look at uh, the biggest experiments because, like with the crypto scene, now we have some use cases running for ten years. Uh, what most uh, wallets uh, do to sort these is uh, mnemonic passwords. Yeah, like like uh, MetaMask. I've been using that, and uh, I lost my phone actually. Oh. My kid broke it, and uh, I had to buy a new one. And I could not, you know, use the the old phone to recover the secret. So essentially, I made a new account because I I hadn't written down the mnemonic password. So that's a big problem. And mnemonic passwords can be organized. There are also libraries to generate phrases of uh, dictionary words that are not related between each other. And they generate high entropy, even higher than a password that you remember. Or you can do like uh, banks did uh, once. You can give um, a series of uh, numbers on paper to print and put in some books. I mean, that, that is also, uh, you can store a certain amount of information in a mnemonic password. So then you say, okay, I have all the data stored uh, and encrypted on a server, and this mnemonic password is, uh, is... We are just like circling around the problem, but there is no magic uh, solution. So yeah, hardware, a mnemonic. Every, okay. every case has a different uh, also threat model because GPP with the migrants, uh, what is that they lose easier pieces of paper? So a mnemonic password uh, written maybe is difficult. Uh, okay, so it's on the use case. Yeah, thanks. Thanks anyway. I will look into these options. Mnemonic password, I saw some libraries. Uh, 
Do you use JavaScript for your stack? I think so. Well, um, the server is uh, Java, is running Spring Boot. But we also use JavaScript, it's not a problem. Mm -hmm. Okay. Just just a very quick question there, uh, because you said the JavaScript, do you have any libraries that, I don't know, some reference libraries that maybe is worth uh, setting there in the in the path? I don't know, I'm asking in case it is relevant. Yeah. Because the mnemonic thing is something that might, we might use maybe for the blockchain part in the future. Um, yeah, so if you already know something that we can look at, that, that could be great, yeah. Yes, it's this. Again, in these cases, I recommend to keep close to where, where do I put it? I put it in the section of uh, this email. Great. Yep. Um, Jaramil above, because we are in the blockchain section where you're writing now. Doesn't matter. We can switch. Okay. Yeah. You can copy. The BIP are the Bitcoin improvement proposals and they're like RFCs for the Bitcoin protocol. And the 39 has defined the mnemonic password. Uh, you can always expect that tech that is adopted for Bitcoin is battle tested because there is a high incentive to crack it. So if you see a wallet that uses a library to do something and it's a production ready wallet for Bitcoin, then it means the implementation is reliable. And uh, I just looked for BIP39 and I found this in uh, yeah, JS implementation. So of course, in this case, you need a word list as you see in the readme because it generates a random unrelated uh, sequence of words from a dictionary in your language. Uh, can we move on? Because it's uh, half past 10 and uh, we have a uh, few questions about cryptography. Yeah. Are you good, guys? Yep. Okay, mnemonic password. This, I mean, yeah, but this was, uh, this belonged here, I think. Yeah, all right. Okay, let's move to the blockchain. The, that would be the second part of the, of the workshop, but uh, this has to go faster. So, uh, Julianos from Backme wrote uh, a few questions. And Ahmed is here to listen to and to explain maybe what he asked. Yeah, okay. But uh, we can read them uh, one by one. Oh, I'm here. My camera doesn't work, sorry. Yep. Welcome, my friend. Hi. So for each article, you have several revisions new data and random interval, even every minute, we want to save the hash of each revision in the blockchain. What is the best practice to save those data to the blockchain? Group them. So, uh, indeed, the grouping them is the way. If you have high, um, high speed on your end, and uh, most uh, blockchain implementations, they do a ready group. For instance, uh, Sodut uh, does, um, it's called uh, bundle, I think. No, uh, it's called uh, not block. I think bundle. 
in in total uh, is called batch batch thank you yes does a batch which is a packet that uh, <clears throat> has multiple transactions and uh, you need to do that if you have high speed in sort of it would mean also that you implement your own uh, uh, sort of uh, batch on your end before sending it and then your uh, transaction processor will be much simpler. Right now on our, the batch is built on the transaction processor side. So I can query the phone, oh, it's the best way to query the blockchain without using the transaction ID since the content ID isn't unique. Yes, so this is a, uh... Okay, I have the answer for this because I spoke uh, I spoke with uh, Puri about this. Uh, the content ID is a concept of our own transaction processor and it's not a concept of uh, Sotus. So it's something that we introduced because for historic, historical reasons that you don't need to understand. Uh, it is not unique. Everybody can write whatever they want. So the short answer is that so you, it, it's... Uh, it's not like an internet domain that you, that you buy it and uh, it's only you using it. So you have to use it uh, with care. Uh, there, there can be conflicts. So it's just basically just a tag. So if you wanna make it unique, you have to work to make, to, to make sure that it's unique enough for nobody to, to copy it. But uh, the, content, the context ID is just a tag. The content, content, content ID. Context, not context, context ID. Good, so that, that I can answer. Okay, we can move to the next question. Follow up, could it be possible to change the blockchain approach to have some sort of domain based prefix for the content ID? Uh, change blockchain approach. The blockchain could be more easily browsable when it gets larger and widely used. Um, not at the current state. I don't know if it makes sense, Jeremy. Domain based prep. So, uh, our question is more how how can we verify like that the, or to connect the original document or uh, uh, the original content with any subsequent content and make that traceable. So, whenever you you write uh, a transaction on uh, Sotooth, Sotooth returns you a unique ID for that transaction that you need to store into a database. Or if the content doesn't contain any uh, information, private information, so it's anonymized, then it sounds like you're looking for a Git solution. Almost, yes, because we want to make, uh, we want to show what the changes were and we want to be able to point at a, uh, external verification source, in this case blockchain, to show that these uh, uh, changes have actually been made. Then you, you use Git for the actual content and uh, you, uh, you insert the, the, Git, uh, the Git hash commit into the blockchain. Ah, that's a good idea. Yeah. Then you leverage all the Git tooling you have. Yeah, exactly. I understand for a content dipping, you don't have to develop anything. Very clever. We could look into building this into restroom, building a Zenkot extension to, to read and write the data to, to and from Git. Yeah, yeah it's nice. Okay.
and this means if you like the solution, you have a Java stack. I think. Yep. It's a good uh, client library for Git in Java. A library for everything. Yeah. When I, I used it, when I use Clojure, so I, I used some stuff. Okay, so this was done. Then we have one question from Ginko. Again, yes, yeah, it's a bit uh, generic, but uh, since we are investigating uh, approaches, uh, so we are thinking uh, at the moment uh, to to do an approach similar to what this semi was saying. So not store the actual things from the blockchain, but the ashes. Uh, and I wonder uh, if we should be careful with this approach. Is, are there any limitation to this kind of approach where, you, in fact, you don't store the real thing, but also some ashes uh, uh, on the blockchain? Or it just, you know, should we think, be careful to some aspect? Or, or you know, or it's, it's a completely uh, uh, no risk uh, operation, let's say. No risk in the sense that no shortcomings, no limitations uh, for afterwards. for. Uh, in general, uh, studying a little bit all the projects, you have this thing in common, that you want to store uh, static information on a blockchain. And there is a caveat that you are uh, not really needing a blockchain for this. This is not what one requires a blockchain for. A blockchain you need when you need to have some computation on the other end, on the blockchain side. So when you need to have a public computation and not only storage. So that is my only warning from for what I'm uh, hearing is that there is the added complexity of a blockchain, but it's not really uh, a hard requirement for your project. When you need to store a hash <clears throat> that is, uh, um, uh, let's say, uh, immutable, so you need a ledger of immutable ashes. You have uh, uh, several other uh, ways to do this. Um, uh, popular uh, services, Datomic, that provides uh, cloud-based uh, immutable hash. You could use Kafka uh, on-premises. Uh, you could use other systems. What you need, uh, um, because then you, you uh, replicate the database. What you need a blockchain for is when you use more advanced cryptography, like the zero knowledge proof credentials, because they are uh, uh, not traceable, you need to prove their validity and you need um, uh, a set of uh, nodes, miners. You need miners to uh, confirm the validity of what is being published on the blockchain. Imagine for a hash, since the origin of the hash must not be known, you are creating a unique identifier, you're publishing it, but there is no way to verify it. So there is no real use for a blockchain. The only way to verify a hash that you can have is say, uh, it's base 64, but that's a, that's a format, and it's uh, 64 bytes. But that's all. It's not um, a proof. All right. So, but, okay. Of course, the discussion about Kafka, as also during the other project, the code is relevant. Uh, but we were thinking that that that, that um, if you want to distribute the trust, let's say, so you, you I mean, or I, I'm not sure Kafka. Uh, can have the same, you know, uh, distribution of, of responsibility, so that no no one party can can change the history. But of course, it's it's a relevant option. Uh, I'm not sure I understand completely the, the effect of the computation uh, because you need to 
so mm, you say that that that, that so just to start, but, but the, well, how is it so also the semin has the same problem? So you, you want to store git, uh, git uh, ashes of uh, or commit number is the same thing, right? It's what most of the world is doing now with a blockchain. But uh, so I, I'm not saying you should stop doing it. Uh, I, I'd rather simplify it. Kafka is a raft protocol, I think, for consensus, which is uh, permissioned. Uh, if you need a permissionless storage, you have IPFS. But if you need a blockchain, is because you need a computation to be confirmed, not a storage to be confirmed. Yeah, but it's not the computation, but at a certain time an operation took place and it was recorded uh, with the NASH, uh, which refers to the document which was produced. Is that doesn't count as a? No, you need to you need the nodes connected to the blockchain to be able to replicate the computation. That's why you need zero knowledge proof because they need to be provided data to execute the computation without seeing the actual data. That is the real innovation of a blockchain. But I'm aware that very, very few projects are using this. Because you mean that because in case there's no validation, I, mean, you could, I could store whatever on the blockchain and say, I got it from that document. Yeah, and, uh... all, all you're asking is immutable storage, which can be provided by replication and other means. All right. I think I think this impacts uh, other projects as well, right? These faults. So it's, it impacts uh, ninety percent of the blockchain projects uh, existing. They are all about storing hashes. The thought experiment, but maybe it's too long. How would you make it uh, into a very ver verifiable process? Do you think there's no way to do that, or? It no, like, no, there is a way. We implemented it in uh, API Room. We made it even easy. So in API Room, you upload a contract and you generate a uh, API, REST API, which simulates already what is happening. You send it some data and it operates the computation and sends it back. Now, that API that can be exported in a, in a microservice is a node that is capable of computation. If you adopt zero knowledge proof capable contracts, then the node will be able to process computation without accessing private information. And for that, you need to use uh, credentials, coconut, and, and so on and so forth. Can it, I need to think about it. Uh, that, uh... Okay, I don't think that there is much we can uh, write under here because this is an open question. So alternatives are Kafka, possible alternatives Kafka. I mean, I um, think the, the general question that you can write in is maybe this quish, quish issue of uh, computation versus uh, permanent storage and what it implies. Uh, for the process, I think. Mm, size of the blockchain. The, the, the phenomenon is uh, very, very present uh, all across the history of uh, uh, crypto. So Bitcoin has a graffiti service. I don't know if it's still up. You can write graffitis on Bitcoin transactions. And um, that, that was a much hated uh, uh, initiative by Colored Coin, I think a master coin uh, people, to fill in the um, eight, 80 bytes of return space in the Bitcoin protocol, which I documented in Decode in a deliverable. And the, the, the miners were uh, adverse to this because it uh, just increased the size uh, of, uh, of the blockchain with graffitis. It was very interesting because um, because the people call it a graffiti service. So they were declaredly <laughs> writing things on walls where people having uh, having uh, buildings uh, didn't want it. It was replicating a social 
dynamic. So it exists since uh, very long. This, I mean, it's not. Uh, it's, I'm aware that the vast majority of people approaching crypto understands this, but it's very hard to make a step uh, uh, further to understand that. It's, uh, it's a slow process. Um, okay, while we were while you were talking, I was chatting with Puria uh, about the question before relative to Git, and Puria added that the history is mutable in Git, which is a which is which may be a liability for Backme. Yeah, yeah, it is mutable because one with direct access to the Git repository can change it and make it yes. uh, disappear. But that's why you have a blockchain with hashes of commits. Yes. Then yes. you can check that it has been uh, fiddled. It has been um, yeah. changed. But it, this is also a, a single point of failure. Uh, so if, if, Git, uh, if the Git uh, database is destroyed, then everything is lost. But you should back up it. Yeah, of course. Oh, again, blockchain is not a backup system. Yeah, yeah. of course. Okay. But, but again, this Git case is not really computation, right? It's just storing a permanent storage. Again, storage, yes. Okay, uh, there is someone writing uh, uh, something here in real time. Yeah, we have... I mean, the use case for storage is that you don't have to run your own uh, infrastructure. So what many people do for instance, in Ethereum, is uh, uh, buy gas, and basically for them, it's like paying a, a, a cloud service to store hashes. Yeah. Okay, who is writing something uh, here on the line 164? Me. Mi Miha, okay, so you're taking notes, perfect. Okay, can we, can we move, on, move on? Kondidi has two questions. Hi, yeah, we do. Yeah. Um, okay, so the, the first question, it's more of like, um, does anybody know if anyone is working on an URI scheme, um, for example, for addressing blockchain transactions in general? <laughs> uh, that, that is something that we have discussed uh, recently, actually, for, uh, for an application we wrote. Well, Recently, I, like it. Sorry, I, I did not understand well the question. Jeremy, line uh, one seventy. Huh. But recently discussed means you discussed this in this workshop, and I didn't listen, or you discussed it internally no, for no, no, Dine. No. We did. Uh, we discussed internally with uh, with a partner. So mm -hmm. something where you could have uh, blockchains linked, or you you could have a uh, way to. No, Andrea is mentioning uh, uh, um, information that doesn't belong to this project. So we okay, have other right. projects <laughs> and then... Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, this is um, pretty much standardized. There is a namespace in uh, permissionless blockchains that uh, actually has a um, prefix, a Uri scheme. What do you mean it's standardized? It's like knowledge everybody has, and I, I don't. <laughs> yeah. I'm just I'm just asking these questions um, uh, in in the absence of Ingo. Those are Ingo's questions, and he just said he couldn't attend, so I am asking on his behalf. So is a beep twenty one. Okay. Okay. And. Um... Then the, the, on the Bitcoin wiki. And um, there are other, uh, um, every new crypto altcoin in, in, the, in the blockchain space, including Ethereum and many other blockchain contract, they, it has a binary prefix as well. So the URI scheme includes a, a human parsable, like you say there, Bitcoin, you see their uh, column, and then um, a number inside the address. The first two bytes, I think, are allocated as a number for uh, the currency 
of the three bytes. Two would be over already. Okay, so I will just redirect him to this to this link. And then hopefully Inge will know what that means. <laughs> um, okay, the, the second question is actually um, more important. I think the URI scheme is more of a, um, because TIP is researching stuff um, and it's important to know. But the second, the second question um, has ties with CONDD. Um, so basically, which, which blockchain should we use um, if we care about long-term availability? Any, any suggestions on that? This is a million dollar question that the <laughs> European Commission is asking every expert. And, okay. Uh, it's, uh, it's very difficult to answer. Uh, my blunt answer is uh, uh, anything that uh, is uh, more battle tested. That's why I quote Bitcoin, not because I'm endorsing the currency, but because it's the one that resisted most attacks. Ethereum did not have to fork to resist attacks in implementations of contracts. And uh, therefore, I think, uh, not as a maximalist, but I tend to think that uh, in, uh, in a serious uh, uh, permissionless world, uh, that is the, the most uh, uh, long term. But of course, uh, it has two, uh, two cryptographic systems. If both are cracked by quantum means, then uh, we could uh, also see it uh, fall down. Um, say that, I can tell you where the European Commission is at. They are, they are experimenting with Hyperledger and Ethereum. Hyperledger and Fabric. Fabric. So Fabric is the first generation blockchain. It's um, quite a patchwork, but it's the one receiving most uh, work. It's uh, 10 times the Apache software when HTTP servers came out. And uh, nowadays we know that uh, Nginx uh, could make it much faster. So uh, of course it's not the best of the words and I think it's uh, very hard to maintain, but it has a high bureaucracy around which is uh, maintained by the Linux Foundation. So a follow-up question, a follow -up question regarding Hy Hyperledger then. Um, so yesterday I, I had an Ethereum meetup. I held my Ethereum meetup and I researched a little bit and I found an article from Coindesk from the 1st of February um, stating that IBM blockchain is a shell of its former set where they can post the link. It's better because they don't say essentially Hyperledger is dead, kind of. Sorry, what, they say, I, uh, Bala, what, can you please repeat? They don't say what? They don't say, they don't say that Hyperledger is dead, but mm -hmm. it sounds like um, they've cut massively regarding their people working on blockchain technologies, um, which is, I just stumbled upon that yesterday. And I, I was like, maybe somebody, it's important for somebody to know here in this project. I don't know. So maybe it's just an article. We're saying this Ethereum? No, uh, Coindesk, actually four people Coindesk. working at IBM. Ah. IBM has uh, fired or moved the project, uh, some people uh, from the blockchain uh, uh, system. But IBM is historically not a bright innovation uh, player in ICT. Mm. They just follow and usually value. So it's not an indicator of what will uh, uh, belong. Uh, I, I would say that if something is adopted by IBM, most likely will not last long, will be maintained through patchwork of, uh, of outsourcing to companies that have to fix the IBM code forever, which is what was happening to Hyperledger. So Hyper, uh, to, to Fabric, Hyperledger is a Linux Foundation consortium. So it's highly bureaucratic, but also has a big community. We choose to work with Sotut because it's a smaller and second generation implementation. And uh, I know from the developers that uh, Sotut has uh, lost uh, a little bit of grip on the fabric plans. I think this is all trickling down. Uh, we are also in the Sovereign Foundation. It's, to make it short, 
it's reasonable to think that fabric will not be a long-term solution uh, uh, for me at least uh, but uh, the the world play is very much i mean i'm wary of uh, of reading news from coindesk and so forth because uh, there is a lot of smoke in the eyes and a lot of hype while the real thing goes without so much marketing so uh, i think that there will be emerging technologies as ours as well in europe that will be clearly setting the mark for a sustainable uh, path right now we are not joining one specific blockchain but we are talking for instance to big chain db which was made in europe and exists since uh, about five years i think in 1.0 since two years and was built in germany and uh, i think that these will be the solutions that are most maintainable not because they are only done better and done uh, uh, in a later stage knowing some of the shortcomings but also because we have uh, uh, local knowledge about them which makes them sustainable what uh, what hyperledger has most and this is politics, is a well-trained, uh, uh, large organization like the Linux Foundation that has uh, metho methodologies in place for community development uh, in open source. That's what we are trying to do in our small size at Dynor. Uh, they are very formal and very uh, IBM-like, but less innovative. So say that, I think that what we are recommending is uh, not just uh, taking an off-the-shelf solution. We are not a supermarket of solutions. Understanding well what is the problem that you need to solve and the tools that need to be combined. So if you use a DLT, you use a VM, a peer-to-peer -peer stack, a consensus system, and a ledger. And you can combine these four things and make sure that uh, uh, actually you use the ones that last longer. Personally, I would uh, applaud an effort which is technically uh, demanding to use something like liquid. So uh, uh, dual peg the system on a Bitcoin uh, to actually work with smart contracts built in a VM. The whole industry right now is looking at Ethereum version 2. And it's not because Ethereum is uh, well written or, or it has a, a reliable governance. I think not. But because they are adopting WASM, which is a very portable uh, uh, format uh, with eWASM for VMs. So it depends what you want to do. In our case, we are also seeking long time, actively seeking long time maintenance. And that's why we build the room on WASM. Because the next solutions that will come, if you build your contracts on Zerum, you will be able to, to run it also on Ethereum too. And you are able to maintain them because they are written in language that more people understand, not only your techies, which one day will go and work for Google and say bye. So maybe I gave you a little bit of a gossip answer to a CoinDesk link. Yeah, thank you, Judith. I'm, I'm aware that CoinDesk is CoinDesk and it's not valid everything that they write, but um, yeah, thank you very much for your answer, it helped me. Okay, dear everybody, I think that was last question and we are exactly at uh, two hours. So if everybody's happy, then uh, we wrap it up. Yeah, I think I have a team stand up and you too. Me too. That's true.